You're listening to the West Salem Foursquare Church Podcast. For more information and to plan a visit, go to wsfc.org. Well, good morning. Good morning, church. We're glad you're here. My name is John. That's my wife, Denise. That's her mom right there. That's her sister right there. So we got the whole fam, not the whole fam, but a lot of the fam is here uh, this week with us. And, um, and you're our family. Thanks for being a part of this service with us. And I want to do uh, just a quick bit of family business, speaking of family. I want to do a bit of family business with us. Just for a few moments before we jump into uh, the scripture, I want to tell you about what's happening with uh, a proposed building that we have going on out in the lawn. And um, you may not have heard a lot about that over the last few months because we just decided to ourselves, let's, let's not say anything until we know more. And, and we didn't know much then. We just knew that it was a slow process and things were were happening, but how many know most of this stuff happens like behind this, before you ever see like dirt move, there's so much that happens. So it's been over a year of us working with um, city and architects and engineers and things, and, and uh, it takes a long time. As a matter of fact, it takes longer than you think. Um, city of Salem, praise God. You know what I'm saying? Right? Praise God. And um, it just takes longer than you think. And so, uh, but we're, we're ready to, uh, to show you some designs on the, on the wall, but also to let you know that uh, we have got approved engineered plans. They've been submitted to the city. We hope to have um, permits pulled here within the next handful of days. And then we've been told uh, that uh, we got guys excited to get all their big boy toys out here and start moving earth. And, and uh, so earth is going to be moved, we think, within the next five to seven days. But, you know, I say that as a man of faith, and then we'll, we'll see. You know, we'll just see. Um, so, but things are really rolling. And, and again, you haven't heard us talk about this a lot because, you know, it can get kind of fatiguing if you keep hearing it and then you don't see things moving. So we really believe we're close to, to having uh, some earth being moved and uh, forms being put in. And we've sent off the final engineered plans to, um, to a lumber company that uh, have been uh, just dear friends uh, of ours for a lot of years. And they have donated the entire lumber pack for us, uh, for this church. So that's pretty incredible. Um, so that's being, you know, they're, they're pulling the lumber and, and they're putting it on, on trucks and wrapping it and, and they're delivering it down. They're hand delivering it right down to us. And so we've got some really cool things. We've got a lot of folks involved in the project in this church, um, talented, uh, licensed, bonded individuals that are partnering with us uh, and they're just chomping at the bit. I've got one particular guy that's just been like, come on, let's go. I'm ready. Let's, I'm gonna, I got my crew ready. We're ready to do this. And so it's going to be very, very, very soon. And so with that, I want to let you know that our hope and prayer, our really great desire is a, our church council and our staff and leadership has really entered into this perfectly saying, Lord, can we do this without incurring any more debt? Um, we, we, we hold a debt over this building. We've got, we pay mortgage on this and over this property. Property and we don't really want to add to that. Um, and uh, so we're, we're, we're really asking you to prayerfully join with us. You, so many already have. And as you start to see the earth being moved out there, I think it's going to get exciting as you see this 5,000 square foot building being put out onto the grass. And it's got um, an auditorium that seats about 220, 230. It's got classrooms. It's got a cafe. It's got multiple uh, restrooms. So it's, it's got a huge outdoor space that we're hoping to expand out into a playground feature and sport court and things for, for students. So it's going to be a really cool project. So we're right now, uh, you know, best case scenario would be right around $200,000 shy of doing this for cash. So as you think about that and as you pray, come partner with us. If you want to give, you can give online. You can uh, put in the offering or any of the, depo- you know, the boxes at the back of the auditorium. We just want to get this done and do it really well and not have it hamper the church. So we believe in future generations. We believe this is a great project for us to invest in so we can see a lot of students uh, come to Jesus. You may not have known this, but last week, last Sunday during this particular service over in that modular building were over 73 students shoved into a space that really, if the fire marshal was here, they would have shut us down. It really, it was pretty, pretty juicy in there. You know what I'm saying? It... (laughs) It was gross. And so um, this, ca- this project can't come at a better time because God's doing some cool things in our students and we're watching him move in their lives. So we want to we wanna invest in that future. All right? That's the news. That's what I've got. I'm pretty excited about it. All right? Let's get your Bibles out. Let's, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. All right, let's get our Bibles out. And um, for the next 12 weeks, what I want to do with you is I want to settle down into 
a book of the Bible, and it's in the Old Testament, and it's a book that I love reading. I love this book. I'm, I, I'm so excited whenever it comes up in our pause reading plan, and I'm able to just go, oh, yeah, we're here again. And, and I love going through it. The stories are inspiring to me. I love studying this book. I like to dig out you know, Bible commentaries and things, and this is kind of just the Bible nerd that I am. I love reading and studying regarding this particular book. And yet, what I had discovered uh, in looking back in all my files and looking back in my computer files, I'd realized that over 25 years of preaching, so I, I, I've been preaching publicly for over 25 years, I have never uh, gone through this book in a series and just never have done it. And, uh, and I'm going to do it today. We're going to start today. It's called The Book of Joshua. Book of Joshua. It's in the Old Testament. It's the sixth book of the Bible, so of the Old Testament. It's the sixth book that you'll find chronologically, and it's the first one to follow what is, is called, you know, the famed Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books of Penta, meaning five, five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, right? So this is the first book that kind of as that, you know, five book uh, series is, is, is concluded, it just follows up into a new generation and a new uh, way of leading, a new land to be taken. And, and I, I'm so excited to walk with you through this. I wonder, when I'm thinking about this, I was wondering, and I don't know if you would agree with this or not, Denise, but I, perhaps I've never taught on this book because we named one of our children, our second son is named Joshua. And maybe somewhere kind of psychosomatically in my mind, I thought, well, I don't want to give him, you know, like preferential preaching treatment. You know what I'm saying? Like you know, he gets an ego and starts thinking it's all about him and things. So I didn't want to do that. I, so I just chose to never go to this book. But then I got to thinking about it. I'm like, well, wait a second. Okay. I've preached on the River Jordan. I've I, well, I baptized people in the river. I mean, our oldest son's name is Jordan. I've talked about the river. I've talked about Jordan a lot. I've preached many messages on Anna in Luke chapter two with Anna the prophetess uh, that was you know that engaged with the with Mary and Joseph and, and the baby Jesus. I I've done that a bunch of times. I've preached a ton of messages on Isaac, the son of Abraham and Sarah. You know, this chosen child, this gift of God to them, and and I. So I preach a lot of messages. So, and here's poor Joshua just thinking to himself, Who, what am I here? Why, don't, why does anyone ever talk about me? So I'm going to give him his due. Here is his, um, what, promised inheritance, if you will, uh, coming to him. And, and he's not here to hear it. So uh, I don't think he's here. But uh, all right. So we're going to go into the book of Joshua. But like any good promise, if anyone's ever made you a promise, you know that that promise then comes with a lot of, of waiting. Comes with a lot of waiting. And we're going to have to wait somewhat ourselves because we're not even going to crack the book of Joshua open today. Okay? Because before you can ever get to Joshua chapter 1, verse 1, you've got to deal with all this history that leads up to entering into the promised land. I mean, you can't just kind of pluck that out of obscurity and go, well, here they are. Moses is dead. Here comes Joshua. You got to, well, who's Moses? What did he do? What did he bring to the table? What was happening prior to this crossing the river Jordan? And so I want to follow kind of the children of Israel, if you will, um, before they cross that river into the promised land, I want to pick up some of this history. Now, speaking of water, okay, I, I, want, to just, I want to give you a quote. I'm going to give you a quote by a guy named David Foster Wallace. David Foster Wallace, an author, um, gave a commencement speech at a university and it in almost instantly became famous. And he started this speech with this narrative. Here's a direct quote. This story goes this way. There are these two young fish swimming along and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way who nods at them and says, morning boys, How's the water? And the two fish swim on for a bit, and eventually one of them looks over at the other and says, what the heck is water? Friends, sometimes we can be swimming in something for so long we don't even realize what we're in. What the heck is water? When you think about our culture, when you think about 
the society in which we're living in. You think about all of our tasks and responsibilities. Many of you, you suspended them for this next hour, but the moment you leave here, you're gonna have to pick them right back up and just dive right. Tomorrow morning just becomes a part of the grind of your life. And you lose the plot. You lose some of the larger purpose as to why our lives exist. What the heck is water? Sometimes we'll get overwhelmed. Other times, some of you will find yourself very, discouraged. You'll think about the promises of God that were given to you perhaps years ago, and you never saw them come to pass. You never saw them come to fruition, and you've just been swimming on and on and on, and something finally jars you. The voice of uh, an older fish, if you will, says, morning boys, how's the water? And I want to kind of talk about this water, what they've been swimming in up to this point But I want us to put ourselves into the narrative and perhaps you're swimming along and you're not seeing the promises of God being fulfilled right away. And I want to encourage you, hopefully through the text, that we can continue to lean in and trust the God of the promise, the God who spoke these things. And even though we've been swimming in kind of, if you will, the waters of this culture, having all of the voices coming at us that God's not real, he's not gonna fulfill that promise, that he's never gonna be true to what he said, and we can find ourselves going, well, maybe this is, maybe they're right. Maybe they're right. Maybe the Lord isn't gonna move on my behalf, and I wanna be the one, perhaps, through the words of this book and the early scriptures in the Pentateuch to be able to say, how's the water? And be able to open your mind up to the fact that this is real. God is real, And he's speaking some things to us and we need to be reminded of them. There's a worship song that's really captured my heart over the last few months. And it has this one line. This one line gets me every time. It brings me to tears oftentimes when I hear it. And it's the phrase where it says, God, if you're not done working, then I'm not done waiting. If you're not done working, then I'm not done waiting. The idea is I'm just gonna keep listening to the Lord Keep pursuing God, keep swimming along, trusting him, following his voice, because he's always working. The question is, are we waiting? And the promise may not be fulfilled right away. How many know most promises aren't? We've got to wait, and we've got to learn how to wait. And so I want to take you back to the beginning and show you how long they had to wait for the promise that was given and then was brought to fruition later on. If you were to go all the way back to the first book in the Bible, it's Genesis, book of Genesis, right? It was a covenant promise that was given. We read about it in Genesis 12. A covenant promise given to Abram, okay? Before his name was changed to Abraham, they called him Abram. And this covenant promise was, in a nutshell, it was Abraham, or Abram, you're, you're gonna be a great nation uh, of great people, and you're going to be living in a great land. And this is going to blow you away, just the kind of fruitfulness that's going to come from your life. Now, if you know the story, how many of you know? Here's Abraham listening to the word of the Lord going, hmm, interesting. I'm going to have uh, many descendants. But I and my wife, Sarah, we're pushing 100 right now. And things haven't been so great with us, you know, in terms of childbearing, you know, right? And, and, and he's just looking at this promise from the Lord going, how is this ever going to happen? that I'll become a great land and a great nation with a great people. But that was the promise given to the Lord. Now, as you move further into Genesis, I'm gonna just kind of jump around a little bit, but I'm gonna take you through a large swath of scripture. Go a couple chapters later, which represents a period of time, but Genesis 15, the Lord then says, hey, let me tell you a little bit about this great land that I'm giving you and the promise and and some particulars about it. Okay, this is how far your inheritance is going to go. And now, if you can imagine people, they didn't have Google Earth. They they couldn't just hop, you know, in an Uber and just head somewhere. Okay, so they're hearing the Lord say, I'm giving you this land as far as that direction and that direction. And their brain's just exploding. But they're hearing this promise from the Lord. Oh, how's this going to happen? I can can barely kind of wrestle down this little acreage I've got right here. And you're telling me up into the high mountains and down into the deserts and around the Galilee and towards the ocean. I mean, all of this was to be their land, including, and I'm going to tell you a name, you got to hang on to this, including that of the land of the Canaanites. Okay, the Canaanites. They're going to kind of creep their way through Scripture over and over and over. They're like just a bad penny. They're just always turning up somewhere. The Canaanites. Now, Genesis 17 Verse 8 
it says this, the whole land of Canaan, these, these people that had been at war with them, these people that they knew were adversarial, the whole land of Canaan will be given to you as an everlasting possession to you and to your descendants after you, and I will be your God. That's the promise. That's the promise given to them. They're going, okay, wow. So you've told me and my wife, who are barren, we can't have children, that we're gonna have descendants as far as the, you know, the, the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Okay, well, that's gonna be interesting to watch. And oh, you're gonna give us all these lands, including that of the Canaanites that are warning it. Um, okay, well, let's wait and see how that works out. And then you have this season of time in which the children of Israel became disobedient, okay, and they fall, fell away from the Lord. They didn't, they didn't listen. They went their own direction. God had them be taken into captivity. Okay, so they're brought into captivity in Egypt. And, and now these were people that had no homeland for, for 400 plus years, perhaps? Right around 400 years? Without a homeland. And now they're looking at this going, wait a second. You promised us that we were going to be this and that. And we were going to have this area and that area. And now we're being held captive in Egypt. We're making bricks without straw. How's this going to play out, God? Now, we know the Lord raised up a deliverer. Maybe you've heard of him. Moses, right? Four words he said. What were his famous four words? Yell them out if you know them. Okay, everyone's like, sure, 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 sure. Oh, I don't want to be, <laughs> you know, how many don't want to be that one person that yells out, you know, like, yeah, and then it's wrong, you know, that kind of thing. So <laughs> let my people go. Let's say it together. Let my people go. There it is. Let my people go. So he comes in as a deliverer. The people were released from captivity. Pharaoh released them under the hand of God. Okay, you know this? And then you may say to yourself, wow, perfect. Okay, they're out of Egypt. They then can just inherit the promised land, just go right on in. And you may think that this story just kind of resolves itself. Okay, wow, you waited 400 years. Well, let's not make you wait any longer. You poor people, just go right on in. But we know that's not the case. In your Bible, you know they began to wander. Their wandering led to more waiting. For over 40 years, they wandered in the desert. That's what they did. And and they were just going round and round circles. I read somewhere... um, that had they, this will blow some of your minds, it blew mine when I heard it, had they left Egypt and just took the direct route into the promised land, okay? Direct route. You know, just don't stop. Go, don't, go past go, collect $200, that kind of thing. Just direct route. Would have taken them 11 days. 11 days, and they would have been there. And they were out wandering for how long? Say it. 40 years. 40 years. It's like some of us guys that we drive around. We don't ask for directions. You know what I'm saying? You know, this is like pre-map quest. You know what I'm saying? But like, oh, just, just cruising, and we're getting more and more and more lost. They wandered aimlessly. Numbers chapter 13, if you kind of p- pursue along in the Pentateuch, you'll see Numbers 13. God then said to Moses, hey, listen, the land is right there. You're, you're, you, keep, you keep going past it. You keep wandering in your sin. You keep wanting to go back. How many remember the old Keith Greek song? You want, so you want to go back to Egypt where it's warm and secure. You, know? you, you have that kind of mindset like, we want to go back. At least we had food and it wasn't so frustrating. We, you know, we wouldn't be wandering aimlessly. And Moses is leading like what, a million and a half? This is like a church of a million and a half of people I just think about this as a pastor. I just think, what would it be like to be pastoring a group of a million and a half people that are all grumbling? (laughs) Smote them, Lord. Just kill them all. (laughs) Be done. I mean, honestly, that would be my prayer. Okay. (laughs) But Numbers chapter 13, the Lord says, listen, you're right there. Send people in. Oh, past enemy lines, send them in, have them spy out the land, bring back a report, okay? Because you guys are so fearful. You need to hear what's going on in there and go in and take that land. Stop dancing around on the outside and on the outskirts. Okay, so they sent 12 men, one for every tribe of Israel. If you know the Bible at all, you know that all of them came back. 10 of them gave a horrible report. Terrible report. We'll talk about that more in just a bit. But, but two of them came back and said something entirely different. One of which, one of which, one was Caleb. The second 
was a man named Hoshea. Hoshea, son of none, not son of no one, and not son of a nun wearing a habit either. Okay, son of none. That was okay. Hoshea. Verse 16 of that chapter uh, 13 of the book of Numbers tells us that God changed his name, and I'm thankful for this, changed his name from Hoshea to Joshua. That's the name we're most familiar with, right? Here's what's cool about his name. And I love this about the Hebrew language, and I love this about languages just in, in general. But Hebrew, the Hebrew word for Joshua is the word Yahshua, and it means the Lord is our salvation. The Lord is our salvation. What a great testimony given even by his own name. The Lord is our salvation. Imagine even standing up in front of the people going, we can do this. They're like, who's, who's talking right now? It's Joshua. Oh, the Lord is our salvation. They would know that. They would know that. They would know that. I think what's most interesting about that is the short form of that word, that Hebrew word, when it's translated into the Greek, and I know I probably just lost half of the room right now. Okay, but stay with me. When you take that Hebrew word, it gets shortened and then it's translated into the Greek, you have a name. And it's a name that most of us in this room would be familiar with, if not all. It's the name Jesus. It's Jesus. The Lord is our salvation. Friends, ultimately the book of Joshua is a story about Jesus. And you may be thinking, wait a second, whoa, I didn't know that. Of course, if you look through every page and read every word, you would never find his name. It's never mentioned. But ultimately, Israel needed something much greater than a land to live in. They needed a savior to redeem them. Ultimately, when you read this story about people going into the promised land, it wasn't just about divvying up some land and going, you take this space and you take this space, you go up into the high countries. No, that wasn't what that was all about. It was about redeeming a people and instilling within them a purpose to live by. Friends, Jesus came, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, he says he came to save his people from their sins. And these folks had been wandering after coming out of captivity. How many know Jesus takes us out of captivity from the enemy? And then we wander almost purposeless. We just go, what is my reason for existing? Why did he say, friends, this is so much bigger than Jesus just plucking us from the precipice of hell and going, oh, I just didn't want you to burn. Come back here. It's so much bigger than him just grabbing us and pulling us out of captivity it's about taking us out of captivity and then looking us in the face and going, and this is the reason why I did that. It isn't just to punch a ticket to heaven. It isn't just so we could escape the fires of hell. Every one of us, every, hear me, every, back to the front, every one of us have been redeemed for a purpose. We've been redeemed for a purpose. And Jesus wants to instill within us by the power of the Holy Spirit that purpose. But like anything, like anything in life, friends, like anything good, you're going to find that there's an obstacle in your way to get to it, right? You're going to be like, okay, I've got a purpose. Some of you are getting all excited. You're like, purpose? Like, oh, good, good, good. And the moment you like turn around to like start walking towards that purpose, you're like thud, right up against something, an obstacle, a challenge, something's in your way. And 10 of those spies, they came back and they said, there's giants in the land. It's really bad. How many know there's always going to be those people? <laughs> there's giants in the land. It's horrible. We can't do it. We're going to be killed. We're going to be destroyed. In Numbers chapter 13, it's verse 33. There's this verse that I've always been captured with. It says, we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And that's how we seem to them as well. Isn't it interesting how when you look at obstacles, they usually begin in your own eyes, right? You know, insecurities, uh, insufficiencies were like, I can't do it, I can't do it. It's, not, it's just, it's not gonna work. It's, it's impossible. You know, you feel like in your own heart and life, you're like, I'm just this big and the promises of God are so huge and I'll never get there. And you end up wandering around in your own insecurities and your own inferiorities 
not realizing like the song we sing on a regular basis is, is, is who you say I am is different. I'm a child of God. This is different. I, when the obstacles are right there in front of me, I get to keep my eyes on the, the Lord of salvation right behind those obstacles just beckoning me to come. Follow me. Follow me. And you're like, oh, there's giants. We're grasshoppers. They're big. And he's like, no, look at how big I am. Look at how victorious I am. And sometimes we look at these obstacles and we think to ourselves, it's impossible. But when the Bible says, with God, all things are possible, how many believe that to be true? This isn't just kind of like righteous kind of cheerleading right now. This is standing upon the promises of the word. When the Bible says, with God, all things are possible, that means any obstacle in our way, any challenge in our way is really minuscule to him. It may be huge to us, but it's small to God. I was thinking about this. This story came to my mind for service. I, I, and then I, I hesitate even telling it, and I kind of hesitate telling it now because I just don't know if it's going to communicate very well, but, but I'm going to do it anyways. Okay, so I was thinking about uh, this trip, the last trip we had to Disneyland. Okay, here's how we got to go to Disneyland. It was pretty sweet. How many remember the, um, the eclipse, the big eclipse we had here? Pretty incredible. It was awesome. How many still think that was a cool day? Like, that was just a cool day in Salem's history. Okay, well, we had this idea early on to uh, lease out our house, or kind of Airbnb our house for that uh, particular weekend, and we did, and these folks from Beverly Hills came, and they found us online, and they paid Beverly Hills dollars to stay in our house. <laughs> We're like, okay. We just put this, we put this wild number out online. We're like, nah, I don't know if anyone will actually do that. And within a few, you know, day or two, someone bid on it and took it. So we uh, found another place to camp out with people and just hung out and gave them their, our home and they gave us all their money. And we looked at this, we're like, this is great. Let's take everyone, let's go to Disneyland. So we took everybody, all the kids, the grandkids. It was just one of those cool events that we couldn't have done otherwise if that hadn't happened. And, and um, so we're there and how many know Disneyland, there's a real way to do this, okay? You've got to really think strategically. You've got to move aggressively. You've got to get those fast passes. You've got to get over to this place. You, gotta, you, you can't just kind of lallygate through Disneyland. You've got to be smart about it. And we were smart. We got all the fast passes we could, and we clocked things out. We knew, okay, we've got to get over to this side of the park, and I'll take the grandkids over here. You go that way. It's that kind of stuff. We did that all day long. Well, we went to this one particular place. We had fast passes in line, uh, in hand. We went up to the guy. We're like, okay, we're coming in. And he started to look at them. He was like, no, I'm sorry. Can't, we can't use these. And the, my kids were there, and they're like, no, we just, we have like six of them. One, two, three, four, five, six. And we, uh, no, sorry, can't do this. And I was listening, and I was thinking to myself, huh, Disneyland, I always thought they're kind of trained their employees to, you know, just find a yes somewhere. Just find the yes we don't want to be people of no. We want to find a yes and celebrate and be happy. Happiest place on earth, right? Amen? Okay. So I'm listening. I got the kids in the strollers back here, and I'm overhearing it. And they were, the guy kept getting more and more hot with them. He's like, no, I said, it's impossible. It's impossible for you to go in this line. The kids were like, impossible? And then I was getting involved. <laughs> Patriarch, I pushed the strollers up. I'm like, excuse me, I'm the dad here. What's, uh, what's going on? sir, you know, he's just a young kid. And he goes, it's impossible for these people to come into this line. Oh, I'm sorry, you said impossible as in like not possible whatsoever. There's no possibility of us just walking into this line right here. No, it's impossible. How many know as a Christian man, you try everything in your heart and life to just maintain your Christian testimony but I got to thinking, no, not now. Um, not now. And I began to just let him know what I really thought about this idea of it being impossible. He kept punctuating that. I said, impossible, sir. You're saying it's impossible for my family to go into this line with these tickets that are marked at this time. Oh, look, it's this time. It's impossible. We walked away. And forever now, since that time, since the, the eclipse, we have laughed at any time someone has ever said, it's impossible. <laughs> really, it's impossible? It's impossible? When we serve a God who says, there is nothing impossible with me, 
I can do, and then he says to us, and you will be able to do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Greater things you will do because I go to the Father, Jesus says, because I'm giving you the Holy Spirit. And so when you think about the promises of God and you start to feel like you're a grasshopper and you start thinking to yourself, oh, this will never happen. Nice promise, Lord. Nice promise. But I think you forgot about the Canaanites, didn't you? Those big giants. But then you find there's a Joshua. And then you find there's his buddy Caleb. And the Bible says something so great about them. It says that they had, I love this phrase, they had a different spirit. A different spirit. They followed God wholeheartedly. They declared, we can do this. They're big, but our God is bigger. Let's go. Let's possess this land. They were the only two individuals from that entire generation that were allowed to go into the promised land. Moses wasn't. Only Joshua and Caleb and all of those that were 20 years or younger were allowed to go in to the promised land. Now, fast forward. Fast forward a bit because now Joshua, this one who had faith, this one who's declared, we can do this. He's now being commissioned to be the leader of these million and a half people. Moses lays his hand on him, prays. In Numbers chapter 27, verse 18, it says, take Joshua, son of Nun." A man in whom is the spirit of leadership. That S is actually capitalized in the scripture. The spirit of leadership. And lay your hands on him. Commission him. Deuteronomy, uh, the book of Deuteronomy 31, I'm going to show you the scripture. It gets a little deeper into this. It says, then Moses went out and spoke these words to all of Israel. He says, I'm now 120 years old. I'm no longer able to lead you. The Lord said to me, you won't cross the Jordan. The Lord your God himself will cross over ahead of you. He will destroy these nations before you, and you will take possession of their land. Joshua will also cross over ahead of you, the Lord said, and and the Lord will do to them what he did to Shion and Og, the kings of Amorites, whom he destroyed along with their land. The Lord will deliver them to you. You you must do to them all that I've commanded you. Be strong, courageous. Can we say those four words together? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel. Imagine what this did to Joshua. He says, be strong and courageous. Say that with me. Be strong and courageous. For you must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors. Remember, all the way back to Genesis 12. Genesis 17. And you must divide it among them. And we'll read about that later as their inheritance. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Let's say this last phrase all together real loud. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Be strong. Be courageous. Let me speak to just some of you today. It's quite possible that it could be more than just a few of you. Let me speak those words. Be strong. Be courageous. Don't be discouraged. You might feel like a grasshopper right now. You might feel very insignificant. Matter of fact, even as I'm saying that, it kind of it may not have affected your posture fully, but it, certainly within your own heart, you just felt something kind of drop. You're like, "Yep, yeah, that's me." No, it's not. No, it's not. You're not a grasshopper. The way the Lord sees you is way different than that. You you might feel like you've got a giant of a decision in front of you that you have to make. That's an obstacle you don't know how you're ever going to get around. And I'm telling you here today, I I believe the Lord wants to meet you with his power, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to minister to you, to give you courage and strength. Give you courage and strength. You might feel like you're waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. Ad nauseum. You may feel like, man, the Lord gave me promises when I was a kid or when I was a young adult or when I was in college. And you feel like, I just feel like this is never going to happen. Forty years may have passed literally in your life. What do you do with that? You just keep looking to Jesus. You keep looking to Jesus. The obstacles are big right in front of you, but Jesus is right behind those obstacles and he is bigger than those. So friends, be strong, be courageous. Here, live a life that's faith forward. And you may, that may bother some of you. And I really wrestle with that phrase because anytime we do something that talks about faith, immediately in our culture, in the Christian American culture, we think to ourselves, uh-oh, preacher failing. He's just going 
big time prosperity, name it, claim it like all, everybody else around the world. No, that's not what that is. That's not what that is. That's just believing God and looking forward rather than always looking behind you. We read in Philippians uh, 3 this morning in our pause plan that we, we, like Paul, we forget what's behind. We press on to the goal that's in front of us for Christ, heavenward. We're aiming that direction. We want to pursue Jesus. We don't want to be discouraged by the obstacles and the giants in front of us. And so here's what I believe. And I, this is regardless of your age in this room. This is for every person, regardless of your age. I really believe there are a number of Joshua's and Caleb's in this room that have a different spirit. You have a different spirit. You just look at it different. You're like, huh, okay, big, big whoop. I just said big whoop, by the way. That was 1980s. It just came out of me right there. (laughs) Big giants, big whoop, okay? (laughs) You're not going to be dissuaded by that. You're not going to turn around and go back to everyone and go, we can't do it. It's impossible. It's impossible. It's not impossible. It's not impossible. You've got a fast pass in your hand. Get in the line. Go to the front of the line for crying out loud. This is what God's calling us to. And when you think about the Joshua's and the Caleb's of this generation, these are people with a different kind of a spirit living in the culture in which we're living. It isn't like you go to the moon. It isn't like you go bury yourself in some other place. You're living in this culture, which by the way, newsflash, is not a whole lot different than the culture that existed then with that of the Canaanites. When you think about the Canaanites, these were a, 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 just a, a depraved Group of people, very deviant sexually, very morally d- d- depraved. They were lawless. They were brutal towards one another, t- through their own people. They were brutal to their own people. Oh, wow, interesting. America, 2019. Deeply deviant sexually, brutal towards their own people, morally depraved. Man, we need Joshua's and we need Caleb's that have a different spirit in this culture. And I'll even say this a step further. And I would say that as I travel around and as I even watch our own youth ministry and our own children's ministry, and as I see across the nation, things are happening, those Joshua and Caleb's, I know it's for every age bracket in this room, but particularly when I look at those that are under 20 right now, they, they're there. The Joshua's and Caleb's are there. And they're living in a culture and it is really morally depraved and yet they're looking at it with a different spirit and they're going after it. And we can do that. We can be a part of this. And sometimes we look at the next generation, I'm gonna rant on this for a second, but sometimes we look at the next generation, all we see are the problems, we just see with their head down, their thumbs act. We, all we hear of is the stories of things that are going wrong. Friends, get some new stories. Get some new stories. There's a lot of incredible things happening with the Joshua's and the Caleb's rising up and they're pointing to Jesus and they're saying, that's the Lord, he's salvation. He's salvation, he's the only one that can save us. He's the only one that can do it. Hopefully, friends, you can grab onto the same kind of optimism as we look at this book. There's a lot of death, there's a lot of destruction in this book. It's something we have to wrestle with, by the way, I'm just saying that, and we will try, we'll try. But the book of Joshua, isn't a dusty history lesson about just claiming the land and dividing it up amongst the people and and then, you know, trying to find rest in the land. This is a story of people that are learning how to do a couple things. They're learning how to rely on a couple things. I just want to finish with these two things really quickly. They're learning how to rely on the revelation of God and on the presence of God. Okay, the revelation of God. If you, if you want to write that down, write that down. Revelation. Joshua had God's revealed written word. He was a student of the Torah, the Pentateuch, the written teachings of God. And it was told by God to Joshua. Here's what he said. The Lord said this, carefully obey this. Don't turn from the right or to the left from this. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Friends, here's what I want to tell you, and I can't think of a way to say it any more plainer than this. God's word is truthful and it is authoritative. Read it and do it. Good? Okay. 
the presence of God. We have the written word of God, but we also have this beautiful thing that comes alongside of it, like uh, we see in the New Testament, the paraclete, that is the one who comes alongside the spirit of living God. When Jesus ascended, the spirit descended. What about the Old Testament? Well, we see hints of the spirit of God all throughout the Old Testament, including when it speaks of the spirit with a capital S being upon Joshua. Joshua had God's manifest present presence in his life. Not only just around his life that was symbolized in the Ark of the Covenant, the tent of meeting, you know, that thing that would go, would kind of move from place to place as they wandered around the desert, but, but what we have is something so much greater. We today, we have the living presence of God in us. The word that was given to Joshua then, I think is still true of us today when he says to Joshua, be strong and courageous, don't be afraid, don't be discouraged. For I, the Lord your God, will be with you wherever you go. He actually finishes by saying, I was with Moses and I'll be with you. So the very God of Moses and Joshua and David and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and and Paul and Jesus, this very presence is available to us. It's available to us. And every one of us have that capacity to read the word and do it and to function as a spirit-filled individual. And my prayer for us is that we would, wouldn't look at the giants and the obstacles in front of us and go, well, it's impossible, can't do it. But instead, fill the Holy Spirit, we would go, Jesus, I'm looking at you, and I'm gonna follow you, I'm gonna walk forward in faith, and if I encounter these obstacles, I know you're gonna give me the strength to go right on through them, to go right on through them. And this is a prayer for us uh, in this season. Something that occurred to me, and I'll finish with this, that when I was diving into the study, and I love studying the word of God, and when I dove into this, I discovered that the book of Joshua, the actual book of Joshua, which we'll get into next week, it encompasses 25 years of Israel's history under the leadership of Joshua. 25 years, this entire book, from chapter one till the end, 25 years. I find that interesting. It may not be interesting to anyone else here, but here's what's cool to me is that uh, this fall, November, actually November 3rd, uh, we're gonna celebrate 25 years of this church's history. That weekend's gonna be a great weekend. We've got the founding pastor coming back and speaking to us, and uh, we're just gonna pull out all the stops and have a great celebration of 25 years as a church. Um, But you know what I think is really cool, even cooler than just a date on the calendar, is the fact that it took some Joshua's and some Caleb's then And it's going to take some Joshua's and Caleb's now to keep moving forward, faith forward. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, let's pray. Stand with me. Thanks for listening to the West Salem Foursquare Church Podcast. For more information and to plan a visit, go to wsfc.org.